presentation. Um, tonight I'm going to be talking to you about some eye problems that can not be with the eye. So something um, wrong maybe with the area around the eye, like the orbit or the eyelid. Uh, it's a little bit of a big topic, so I'm not going to be talking about every single eyelid problem. Things like um, entropion, you know, I think I've covered in some other lectures and we'll cover again, I'm sure, but tonight we're going to be focusing more on um, eyelid diseases and orbital problems. So uh, as an outline, we're going to first go over some anatomy of mostly of the eyelid um, and then talk about some eyelid diseases, especially eyelid masses, um, their treatment, and we'll talk a little bit about blepharitis. And then we're going to move on to orbital diseases and focusing on uh, neoplastic diseases, orbital cellulitis and abscesses, and then we'll touch on a few other orbital diseases we can see and then some of the treatment of those diseases as well. So on the, on the screen, you'll see the anatomy of the eyelid. So this here is the cornea. This structure here is the cornea, and then this is the eye. So we're gonna focus on the eyelids. The eyelids have, oops, sorry. The eyelids have um, several important structures. Um, we have the orbicularis oculi muscle of both the superior and inferior eyelid. Um, and those are, are a, it's kind of a circular muscle that surrounds the whole eye. We also have the nibovian glands, which are located within the eyelid, sort of in the center of the eyelid and the upper and lower eyelid. Um, and there are little orifices of those glands that are um, multiple openings along the edge of the eyelid. We also call that the gray line. Um, that's the openings to those mybovian glands, or sometimes they're called tarsal glands. We also have eyelashes, um, also called cilia. There are several important uh, important lacrimal glands. The orbital lacrimal, lacrimal gland, which is sort of dorsolateral to the eye. And then we have the gland of the nicotating membrane and the nicotating membrane itself down here. So I'm going to first start talking about a really common eyelid mass that we see called the meibomian gland adenoma. There's also a sort of variant of that tumor called an epithelioma. Uh, there, these tumors are very similar in behavior. The epithelioma is a little bit more likely to recur in the site um, post-treatment, but they're pretty similar. Meibomian glands are those glands, again, that produce the lipid layer of the tear film. So a very important um, gland that makes the, the tear film not evaporate as quickly. So we can see masses that come from those glands. And since the glands are in the very center of the eyelid, sometimes these masses are present on the lid margin. Um, sometimes they're present on that ad adjacent skin to the eyelid margin or sometimes they're present on the palpebral conjunctiva. And sometimes they can be all three or, or two of those locations. So they can kind of go out any which way. They tend to be pink and lobular, but they can be pigmented uh, variably. They can often ulcerate and bleed, especially when they've been there for a long time. And that's usually when the owner really starts having a problem with them. They're generally benign. Uh, you can see adenocarcinomas, but that's not very common. Uh, and usually, Wedge resection and cryotherapy are our major ways of treating these adenomas. So I, have, I wanted to show you some examples that does show you the, how variable the appearance of these tumors can be. Uh, this one's kind of you know, lobular and pigmented. This one's just all pink and, and um, at the medial canthus. Um, this one's ulcerated. Uh, this one here is more pigmented. This one is pigmented has a pink area and even has like a little area where there's been some uh, glandular material that's inspissated in that spot. You can see that whitish material through the palpebral conjunctiva, just a, a consequence of this eyelid mass blocking those, those tarsal glands, those mybovian glands. So this is a really um, kind of a representative uh, pictures of what these tumors can look like. Um, melanomas are another kind of eyelid mass that we see. Uh, they tend to kind of come in two variants. They can either be a pretty smooth, solitary, pigmented mass. These ones are really ideal for a wedge resection. Cryotherapy doesn't work 
quite as well for melanoma. So I prefer to do a wedge resection if I really am suspecting a melanoma. Um, they can also be flat and broad and sort of encompass more of the eyelid margin. This is a more complicated, um, more complicated uh, mass to um, perform surgery on. And so maybe, you know, might not be amenable to some of the more um, routine surgeries. We can also see melanomas, melanomas of the conjunctiva, um, which, you know, if it's a small enough one, you can surgically excise it. Sometimes if we have a large one, like I'll show you in a minute, um, we have to do an enucleation or some sort of other grafting procedure to try to uh, save the eye. So here's some examples of a melanoma. In this, we see that solitary, dark, smooth, pigmented mass. This dog actually has a couple of them. This is a, a boxer dog who obviously also had some other chronic eye, eye problems. Um, and then this dog had a very large uh, melanoma, which they could not determine if it was uh, eyelid in origin or conjunctival, but we ended up enucleating this eye and taking off this mass and uh, the dog has done very well since that surgery. So papillomas are another kind of tumor we see. These are often viral in origin. Um, they can be white to pink to even a little bit pigmented. They tend to be pedunculated and kind of have this cobblestone texture. They're more common in young dogs and sometimes they will have also oral papillomas or multiple papillomas on the eyelid. They can even regress without any kind of treatment and tend to be a benign in behavior. Um, there are, you can treat these with azithromycin that's been shown to cause regression of these papillomas. So if you have that suspicion, then you could try a course of azithromycin to see if it will resolve the issue. Um, they also can be treated with a wet resection and cryotherapy. Sometimes I'll be treating one eyelid tumor and, and then go ahead and treat all the tumors that are there and find that one of them is a papilloma. See, this is a typical appearance of a papilloma. It's pedunculated. Sometimes there's pigment, pink areas, um, pretty easy to treat. There's a couple other eyelid masses that we can see um, in dogs. This picture shows a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, squamous cell carcinomas tend to be locally invasive. They can metastasize, especially later on in the, in the disease process. Um, they can be amenable to both wet resection um, and cryotherapy. If they get larger, we may need to use some advanced surgical grafting techniques to repair them. This is a patient who presented to me with a very infective looking ulcerated um, eyelid and I performed cryotherapy and a biopsy diagnosed the squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, it improved so much with the cryotherapy, even though I recommended the dog return for a wet resection so we could try to remove the tumor completely. The owner did not do that because the dog looked so good, came back several months later and the eyelid looked like this. We were able to do a wedge resection and remove all of the squamous cell carcinoma and um, that dog also has, has done very well since that procedure. In this picture, we have a histiocytoma, which are benign eyelid masses that we can often see in younger dogs. They'll regress on their own, but often before they regress, they can get ulcerated and kind of worrisome looking to the owner. Um, you can you can treat these with cryotherapy to make them go away faster, um, but you can diagnose them with a fine needle aspirate. So if you suspect it's a histiocytoma, you can do a fine needle aspirate. You wanna remember when you're doing a fine needle aspirate around the eye that you never wanna direct the needle towards the actual eyeball. So you can see on the slide, I've got this needle directed sort of parallel to the eyelid margin. And so that if the dog did move, I wouldn't inadvertently um, puncture the eye with my needle. Uh, this patient, we did cry, cryotherapy on this eyelid mass, and you can see post cryotherapy that this area is pigmented, is depigmented, but there's no longer a mass present. And depigmentation is a normal process with cryotherapy um, where the area will turn depigmented and eventually will repigment, and that eyelid will be back to normal. Uh, this is an unfortunate case. This was a, a cat that was kind of a, um, an outdoor cat that had this, obviously it's a white cat, which is a risk factor for developing a squamous cell carcinoma. But by the time I saw this cat, this mass was uh, very large, ulcerated, um, and painful, very painful for this cat. 
we did do a biopsy to diagnose the squamous cell carcinoma. At the time of biopsy, I did do cryotherapy, which, which helped this, this cat, and we did put him on pain medication um, to help with some of his discomfort. Um, but in the end, with the size of this tumor, it wasn't gonna be um, something that the owners wanted to or were able to perform the amount of surgery, potentially radiation therapy, um, that would need, need to be done to try to save this cat. So um, they, they ended up just trying to um, palliate this until it wasn't, um, wasn't a good quality of life for the cat anymore for him to be put to sleep. But this is oftentimes, you know, uh, kind of a dreaded tumor in these white cats because it can become so erosive and can be, uh, with it's local invasive, can be very difficult to, to treat and eradicate. So whenever you're doing any kind of eyelid surgery for these eyelid masses, uh, we need to do a surgical preparation. Um, I generally clip for like a wedge resection, but if we're doing cryotherapy, I don't usually clip that unless the hair is really getting in the way of the area. Um, when you're clipping, sometimes the eyelashes can still be present. So sometimes it can help to put a little bit of ointment on the scissors and then cut the eyelashes off if you need to. Um, Whenever we're doing any kind of surgical preparation around the eye, you definitely don't want to use anything like chlorhexane or alcohol. That will cause ulceration of the cornea. So we always want to use uh, betadine. We typically use a dilute betadine solution, which is like a one to 50 dilution, like a weak tea. This is safe for the conjunctiva and the cornea. You can also use the full strength solution on the skin surrounding the eye. So here's some pictures of um, using that weak T betadine um, around the eye in preparation for some sort of surgical procedure. So I want to show you how we do the debulk and cryotherapy. Um, cryotherapy is sometimes um, not really accessible to um, most veterinarians. Uh, we here at IndyVet have a um, cryotherapy doer, and we actually have the cryo um, liquid the liquid nitrogen delivered here to our hospital in like a large doer. And then we are able to get the liquid nitrogen, um, you know, into the device that I spray it from for, for our use. So there are liquid, there are availability of cryotherapy, you know, handheld units. Um, I honestly don't have any experience with those. So I wanted to show you what we're doing when we're doing cryotherapy. So you're kind of aware of that. Um, if you are interested in doing cryotherapy in your practice, um, there are potentially some options, uh, but I do, I'm not really aware of a lot of those that are more um, usable for, for a general veterinary practice. So we have this patient sedated. We usually will sedate them with dextomator and some, some, pain, some pain medication like methadone or, um, or hydromorphone. If the patient is very elderly or we don't feel like dextomator is a safe choice, then sometimes we'll you know, use propofol or something IV um, just for a short anesthesia. But we're here, we have a chalazing clamp. And the chalazing clamp is important because it is positioning my eyelid tumor. It's also um, clamping the vessels around the tumor and stopping you know, excessive bleeding. Um, and what we can see in this picture is we've used a pair of scissors to just cut that eyelid mass off flush with the eyelid. I usually try to keep it pretty flush with the eyelid um, and, and potentially you're gonna be leaving some tumor there behind and that's okay. Once we've debulked this mass, we can submit this, this um, tumor for a biopsy so we know what it is. I then usually perform cryotherapy where I spray this area typically about three times um, with the spray unit and um, the chalazian clamp here can also help to get the freeze, uh, get it to freeze faster and, and thaw more slowly, which is what you want with cryotherapy. Cryotherapy works by a quick freeze and a slow thaw. By, by stopping that blood flow, you're able to achieve that. And then you probably are going to have some bleeding because the eyelids are very vascular. So typically we use a combination of, um, you know, manual pressure and even a little bit of handheld cautery to stop any kind of bleeding. Um, typically that's able to be done by the end of the procedure. And then we remove the glazing clamp at the end. 
So here's an example of a patient who had um, an eyelid mass. This is the actual patient who um, the pictures are of that we did the procedure on. So this is a couple weeks post debulk and cryotherapy. You can see there's a little bit of an erosion here. Um, and this area has got depigmented, as I explained, happens with cryotherapy. But within a few months, this area will be repigmented. Um, and just for an example, this is what this eye looked like prior to cryotherapy. Now this dog did have a couple other things. We had a little uh, conjunctival mass here, which I also froze after I removed it and had an indolent ulcer. So I did a burp keratectomy on this patient also. So a, a number of things happened, but the patient was doing much better two weeks after cryotherapy. Um, the, the other thing that we often do for the, these eyelid masses is a wedge resection. And a wedge resection is sort of more available for use in the um, general veterinary practice. Now, the most important thing to remember about a wedge resection is that you can only remove up to a quarter of the um, eyelid margin, which ends up being around eight millimeters for most dogs. So that's um, more than that. We'll talk about that later if you try to remove more, a bigger area than that eight millimeters. So when you're doing a wedge resection, oftentimes this animal is under general anesthesia, um, and you can use a 15 blade to cut a wedge-shaped incision. I usually cut a house-shaped incision. It just closes more nicely than if you just make a V-shaped incision because the edges where you cut at the eye of the margin are um, parallel to each other. So it just closes nicer. So I make a house-shaped incision, as you can see here. We make a house-shaped incision. And then we um, use, this, use scissors to cut through the subcutaneous tissue in the same shape. It's important when you're doing this that you look at the caudal aspect or the posterior aspect of the eyelid to make sure you're removing all the tumor. You don't want to remove just what you can see in the front if it's bigger in the back. So you need to make sure you remove it, you know, completely. Um, I usually close the subcutaneous tissue, maybe just with like one simple, like a simple interrupted um, suture, something absorbable like Sixot um, Vicryl is what I typically use. Um, you could use something else absorbable also, but you don't really want to use anything too stiff because if it um, does rub through, you don't want to cause a corneal ulcer. When you do your subcute suture, you don't want to penetrate the eyelid margin or the skin or the conjunctiva. You just want to get that subcutaneous tissue and make sure you're not is within the eyelid and it's not going to rub on the eye. Then I usually do a simple interrupted to close the eyelid margin. Um, and again, I do recommend histopathology uh, just so we can be sure that, that we got it all and then it's that we know what the tumor is. So here's an example of how to close this eyelid. There are several different methods when you're doing an eyelid closure. Um, you can just do a simple interrupted. And as you see in this, in this diagram, we've taken the ends of the suture after we've tied it and we've left them long so that after we tie two throws on this next bite, we can incorporate the ends of that first bite, the suture, into that second one and tie them out of the way, leaning away from the eyelid. So that's often a good way to, um, to, to get those sutures away from the eye. The other thing you can do to do a closure, which is sort of my preferred technique, is called a figure of eight. Um, and to do a figure of eight, which is shown here in diagram C, you actually go in through the skin um, a few millimeters away from the eyelid margin. You come out at your cut edge, you go back in through the cut edge, and then you're gonna actually come out right at that gray line, a couple millimeters away from your cut edge. Go back through the cut line, a couple millimeters from your cut edge. You're gonna exit through that cut, cut edge of the, um, of your wedge, and then you're gonna go back through the cut edge and come through the skin. So that's why it's called a figure of eight. You tie that knot, and what that does is it keeps the knot away from the edge of your suture. If this is too complicated, as I said, you can just do a simple, um, you can just do a simple interrupted here, and then tie the edges into the set, tie the ends, excuse me, into the second bite. I wanna just remind you when we're doing any kind of, um, tissue apposition that we want to have to have a good closure and to have it oppose well, which is super important when we're closing the eyelid margin. Um, if you take even bites, as shown in, in B, 
you're going to have a very good closure. Sorry, my lights just went off in here. Um, you're going to have a very good closure as opposed to if you take, uh, uh, you know, a bite where you come out in the middle and then you enter in the deep tissue, you're going to end up having a stair step and having an eye that's not as well opposed. So let me just turn the lights back on. <clears throat> so we want to remember that if we're doing a wedge resection, that we cannot remove a mass or an eyelid margin bigger than a quarter of the eyelid, which is about eight millimeters. So it's really important to remember that a lot of these masses are benign in a dog. They're, they're usually benign. And so we don't want to do a greater harm by doing a surgery like this that's going to create more problems for the dog than the eyelid mass was in the first place. So for these big masses, oftentimes they're inflamed and ulcerated. Um, cryotherapy is really ideal. I know sometimes they can look a little nasty and you think, well, this whole eyelid is not going to be able to be repaired, but the cryotherapy really can address a lot of those issues and prevent us from having a, a, a defect in the eyelid. So if you try to resect an eyelid mass that's bigger than eight millimeters or eyelid margin that's bigger than eight millimeters, what you're going to find is that mat, that incision will likely dehiss. Um, you'll end up with trachiasis where those hairs are going to rub on the cornea and potentially ulceration. Um, and the other thing that you can potentially do, there are other grafting procedures you can do like an H-plasty for some of these more um, you know, large eyelid masses. <clears throat> but the H-plasty doesn't have as good of an outcome as a cryotherapy does. So I really prefer to do cryotherapy Get a, get a biopsy if I do think it's something more sinister. And if it is something that's not going to be fixed with cryotherapy, then plan to do a more complicated surgery and discuss that with the owner so that they're aware of the outcome. So that would be my advice is that, you know, if it is something that's bigger than that, talk to them about cryotherapy and potential referral if that's not something available in your practice. So this is another uh, patient that I, I found was interesting when this patient presented, <clears throat> had this kind of swelling on the eyelid here that almost looked like an eyelid mass. <clears throat> but when we looked further, we could actually tell that this was a large defect in the center part of the eyelid. And you can see these hairs that are rubbing on the cornea. And this was actually the normal eyelid margin. So there was normal eyelid margin here and here, but we had this defect in the center. So it almost looked like an eyelid mask, but it, but it wasn't. It was just that area that was, um, that was normal and was sticking out because of this defect in the center. Okay, so I'm going to move on now and talk about blepharitis just kind of briefly so we can talk more about orbital diseases. Um, blepharitis is a little bit of an annoying, <laughs> an annoying disease. I think the dermatologists feel like it's an eye problem and the Ophthalmologists feel like it's maybe a skin problem, um, and so it gets a little bit tossed around. Um, we can often see uh, bacterial blepharitis, um, something like puppy strangles, which can be you know, more severe and cover the whole head is an example of a time we could see blepharitis. But we can also see staph and strep infections um, common, you know, potentially dogs that have like alopecia or other underlying skin issues where that area is just um, going to be more likely to get a dermatitis is we have that dermatitis on the eyelids and that's blepharitis. So sometimes it can be just a staph or strep infection in an otherwise allergic dog that we tend to treat similarly. You know, we may put them on something like Apoquel or oral steroids to control the atopy and control any sort of bacterial um, infections with like an oral antibiotic like ceflaxin or Simplicef or Cefpidoxine can sometimes get these things under control. Um, and prevent them from, from, you know, continuing to be a problem. We can also see things like, um, you know, ringworm present on the eyelid. Now, this is generally part of a generalized infection, but if you suspect ringworm, obviously you can, you can do testing to see if it is ringworm, just continue, you know, obviously you can get those problems on the eyelid as well. We can also see things like Demodex or sarcoptic mange. So um, generally those patients may have, you know, dermatitis otherwise on their body, but they may not. So doing a skin scrape to rule out some of those um, mites can be helpful to make sure that you're treating that appropriately. And the biggest category, I guess, that I'd see besides bacterial, you know, secondary to atopy 
is immune mediated blepharitis. So I'm going to show you a, an example of a patient that I saw that had that. Um, this is DOG. Uh, he is a he is a three year old male neuter Brittany Spaniel. And when he presented to me, he had these very swollen eyelids, almost like a purplish appearance under the eyelid. You can see how um, how wet this is. There was some sort of purulent discharge and epiphora. The eye itself looked normal. There was no problem with the eye, but the eyelids were very hyperemic, um, and he was un he was uncomfortable. Both of his eyelids looked this way, but the, the left one here was a little bit worse. So we treated um, DOG with um, an oral steroid. Um, we put him on a pretty good dose of tubing per keg, so an immunosuppressive dose, uh, probably just for like a week, and then we began to taper that. Um, we put him on oral cephalexin, a pretty good dose that you want for skin, like 30 mg per keg, um, twice a day. And then I also put him on some Neopolydex drops, uh, probably stained the eye to make sure he didn't have an ulcer. Um, and three weeks later, this is what the eye looked like. Um, we went ahead um, and slowly tapered the oral steroid, and he did well without, without a uh, continued use of an oral steroid. Some of these dogs will have recurrent disease. I occasionally have used a long-term steroid-sparing immunosuppressive, um, you know, like cyclosporin or um, azithromycin, or, or, um, I don't remember the other one, but, but I, you can use other steroid-sparing um, medications if this is a recurrent issue for these dogs. All right, so I'm going to move on to talk now about um, orbital diseases. So I think the first thing to recognize when you're looking at treating orbital diseases is knowing the difference between a globe that's actually enlarged um, versus an eye that's sticking out abnormally. So I want to make sure that I explain those terms um, and you understand the different disease processes behind the term. So a bupalic eye is an eye that's enlarged. The globe itself is enlarged. And this is due to chronic glaucoma. These dogs will almost always be blind in that eye. And they generally will have many abnormalities with the eye itself. Edema, vascularization, um, a lot of other changes potentially inside the eye. And they usually have a high eye, um, intraocular pressure. So this is in contrast to exophthalmus. Exophthalma means that the globe itself is of normal size, but there's something behind it that's pushing it out. Um, sometimes it's displaced in other directions as well. Um, so this often happens due to retrobulbar disease or potentially a disease process with the extraocular muscles. Um, so the globe itself is usually normal and visual. Um, it can sometimes have, if it's been a more chronic issue, the patient may have trouble blinking over the eye which in that case, it could have ulcers and problems like that. But usually the eye is fairly normal. Um, and if the pressures are high, it's typically because of the pressure on the globe. So we'll, we'll talk about that with one of our cases. But usually it's not a true increase in the pressure. And that's usually evidenced by the fact that the eye can see. Usually the eye is visual, unless there's um, some involvement of the optic nerve. So I'm going to show you some pictures of exophthalmus versus bupthalmus, so we can just clear that up. So this is a dog who had um, the left eye was exophthalmic. You can sort of see in this picture that the eye itself looked pretty normal. It wasn't a lot of abnormality with the eye, but the eye is also displaced laterally and dorsally. Um, you can see that the eyes are not symmetrical. When we look, sometimes it's easier to tell this from above, too, that the eye is sticking out. Um, I'm not sure if this is actually the best photo of this, but you want to look from above and see if, the, if it looks like the eye itself is protruding. This is in contrast to uh, bupthalmus, where the eye itself is actually enlarged. The whole eye is bigger. And these eyes often have a lot of other abnormalities. So this cat had um, synechia, where the eye, the pupil was kind of stuck together into the lens. There is a, a posterior lens luxation um, and a cataract. So this eye was a blind eye, had a high pressure, and had a lot of intraocular abnormalities. So I um, want to talk about some, to talk about uh, this orbital diseases, I'm just going to present some cases. Um, so we'll first talk with Bear. We'll first talk about Bear. Um, he is a 10-month-old mixed-breed Mastiff. 
Um, there was a caution, so it was a little bit more difficult to deal with him. He was not very friendly, um, which was made worse by the fact that he was in a lot of discomfort. So Bear presented, here he is here, he presented with abnormalities with his right eye. The right eye was exophthalmic, his third eyelid was elevated, his third eyelid was hyperemic, um, he had, you know, purulent discharge, and he also has a third eyelid abnormality which was not related which is his cartilage is abnormal and is causing his third eyelid to roll, which you can kind of see in that photo. So Bear's history was that he had, he had a kind of acute onset of his right eye being swollen with having mucopurulent discharge. He was lethargic. He was anorexic. The owner had tried to see if there was a problem in his mouth and the, the dog cried out when the, when the owner attempted to look inside of his mouth. On exam, he did, he was normothermic, um, but his right eye was exophthalmic, and he did have a little bit of redness with both of his eyes, but otherwise, that right eye was, you know, both eyes were pretty normal. Um, when we had him anesthetized, we could see that the right uh, pterygopalpine fossa was distended. So that's that area that's just caudal to the last maxillary molar. That area was distended, and um, of course, we couldn't tell that off, but sometimes you can look inside the mouth and tell that um, you can look at that area prior to, um, you know, other diagnostics. So I want to show you the CT that we did on Bear, um, and then I'll point out some of the characteristics afterwards. So on the CT, we're starting at the nose. You can see the nasal cavity here. This is the um, right side over here. And what you can see is we start to see this right eye is protruding a little bit more than the left. And what I want to see, there's all this swelling and we see, start to see this hypoechoic area in, um, in the eye. There's a lot of swelling and cellulitis um, on the head that you can see as well. So here's some still shots from the CT that we did on there. Um, and on this image, you can see that this right eye it's, it's a little bit further um, forward, but also you can tell it's displaced. It's a little bit laterally and dorsally displaced compared to the left eye. And then in a further caudal slice, you can see this hypoechoic area, um, and that's actually a retrobulbar abscess. So he had um, an abscess behind the eye. There was cellulitis and swelling kind of all around within the orbit and even on the, the side of the head. So he's quite swollen um, with this abscess and cellulitis. We didn't see any kind of foreign body on the CT. Um, and oftentimes these abscesses can be um, difficult to determine the cause of. Um, foreign body can be one cause, but we didn't determine uh, the cause of it in Bear. So what we did for Bear um, was while he was still under anesthesia, um, there was a swelling actually that I, that, that was present here behind this uh, caudal maxillary molar. And I made an incision with a scalpel blade just through the mucosa, just where that swelling was present. And I'm going to show you a video of what happened next. Um, what you want to do when you're, when you're draining these abscesses, so in, since we actually saw an abscess on the CT, we wanted to drain that area. So after I made that incision in the mucosa, we took a pair of hemostats, and you can see the pus draining right here. So that pink white pus is draining from this area. So what we did is I took a hemostat. We never want to close the hemostats within the incision. So I put them in, closed in the incision, and then opened them up um, and allowed that area to drain. What we're doing now is we're getting a culture. Um, and after we've gotten our culture, we are going to get some more swabs to a cytology. Um, after we get our cytology, let's see if I have it here a little bit. After we get our cytology, um, I had my nurse push on the eye while I was um, putting some opening my hemostats within, but not closing them, but opening them within this incision. And you can see all the pus that's now draining back here um, behind those hemostats. We're really draining a lot of pus from this area. You can see the pus still out over here. So this is a very large abscess that Bear had. It was very satisfying to remove all that pus from behind um, his eye. You can still see it draining out. Do not die. I don't know exactly what that looks like. 
artifact behind the eye, you want to damage those structures, but oftentimes if you just open that area with the pinky step, the pus will be strained out. And then you just leave that to heal um, a second inch. So on there, prior to the CT, we did a CBC chem, which showed he had a mature neutrophilia and increased white blood cells. Um, we did the CT, um, and then we lanced that retrovulvar abscess since we actually saw the abscess on the CT. The cytology showed many degenerate neutrophils. Um, there were red blood cells present, present and cocci were present in strands and couplets. Uh, a culture, which of course we didn't have right when we discharged him, but came back as Klebsiella oxytocosa, which was really sensitive to most things. So it was a very sensitive um, organism. We had put bear on Clavamox and it was sensitive. We left him on that. We treated him for two weeks um, on the antibiotic. He was on carprofen and tramadol. Um, because the left eye was exophthalmic and I was worried he wasn't gonna be able to blink over it as well, we did put him on an artificial tear ointment. We instructed the owner to feed him a soft food for the next few days at least, um, for a week potentially. Usually these dogs do much better after three days um, and, and should be pretty well resolved after a week. Um, if you can, if your patient will tolerate the warm packing, that can help um, them feel better. And Bear was doing great at a week post-op. We didn't see him back due to his aggression. He didn't, the owners liked to not to come back since he was doing so well. Um, but generally, this therapy will resolve these retrobulbar abscesses. If it does recur, then I would be worried, more worried about a foreign body and um, pursue a CT if, I, if that did recur after we resolved the problem the first time. So a retrobulbar abscess is a risk factor to be a dog could choose on sticks. Um, so sometimes, you know, potentially that area could penetrate um, uh, the same area that we saw the, um, where we drained it from, that area can be penetrated with a stick and potentially introduce bacteria. Um, retrobulbar ultrasound can also be used to diagnose a retrobulbar abscess. Um, or the CT. Um, if you see an abscess, then I usually drain it. If I don't see an abscess though, and it just looks like cellulitis, and I'm really suspecting more that this is a retrovulvar cellulitis than a, than a tumor, then I will oftentimes treat them with an oral broad spectrum antibiotic and an oral NSAID, plus or minus gabapentin. Typically, they will respond to this therapy within a few days. So if they're not responding to this therapy, again, that's going to tell you that maybe um, that's a patient who needs a CT or maybe needs, um, you know, culture or maybe their abscess needs to be drained if that's the, the case. But usually these patients do quite well. And typically, um, even studies have shown that, that you know, th this therapy can resolve these completely most of the time. So we're going to now talk about um, neoplasia. So we're talking about Buzz. Buzz was at least four years old. The owners really didn't know for sure how old he was. He is a um, he was a male neutered uh, domestic medium hair cat. Very very sweet. Um, you can see in this photo that he had a swelling kind of of his lower lip and under the eye. He had dry mucopurulent to, to reddish discharge from the eye. The third eyelid was elevated and it was even ulcerated um, as was there was a small area of ulceration on the cornea and it was sort of the way this is linear it was linear this ulceration and it was due to exposure so this was so swollen that buzz was not able to blink over the eye and we were seeing exposure keratitis resulting so buzz had a history of uh, swelling around that left eye for and the third eyelid elevated for about a week he seemed to just not be feeling well to the owner. The owner noted about a month ago that he was sneezing a lot, but then now it seems that he was not sneezing quite as much. Um, because the, the um, referring vet had noticed a high pressure in the eye, they had started him on latanoprost and drizolmectimolol three times a day. Um, the, the referring had rechecked the pressures and found that they were still high despite that treatment. So on his exam, he was normal thermic. He did have the left eye was exophthalmic and deviated, um, deviated laterally. His third eyelid was elevated and the ulceration as was noted in the photo. He did have a corneal ulcer um, in also. 
and he had a firm swelling under the left eye and of his left upper lip. He did also have severe dental disease and even a little bit of mild um, epistaxis from his left nostril, which was the, the same side, its lateral side to the eye problem, and his left submandibular lymph node was enlarged. <clears throat> so um, I discussed with the owner that I was concerned this was a tumor um, that could be related to his dental disease and that they could pursue uh, maybe dental radiographs with their um, filling that um, and you know, potentially extractions if needed and um, biopsy the swelling on the face. Um, but the owners really wanted to, to move on with the CT. Um, so we went ahead and we did a CT on Buzz. Um, here's, here's his fitting position for his CT. Um, I'm gonna show you what the CT looked like. So this is again, starting from his little nose. So um, you can already see the swelling on his, on his side, on his left side, um, and it takes up through the lip. We start to see the eye here, and the eye is protruding. This is the other eye. So you can see this eye was came into the view first. We have a tumor in the nose, in the mouth, in the orbit, and vertically that area. So you see the tumor in the nose, in the orbit, and then on the lip. Um, and it was kind of eroding through, you know, the bone there. Okay, and um, what we did after the CT, because we were concerned about a tumor, um, we took some biopsies. Now there's multiple places you could biopsy um, a cap like Buzz because he had, he had it kind of in so many locations. So sometimes after I do the CT, I'll find that there's actually more disease in the nose and I'll get the internal medicine doctors to come down and biopsy, um, get Dr. Gillespie um, to biopsy the nose. Um, or sometimes we see that there's mostly tumor in the orbit. If that's the, the um, location, then I'll often use the true cut biopsy and I'll direct it. Obviously it looks here like I'm going through the eye, but I, I did not hit the eye. We went underneath the eye um, where based on CT, I could see a lot of the tumor was present and was able to biopsy it there. Because he also had this swelling on his lip, that was a really easy place to biopsy. Um, so we did a punch biopsy on the lip. Um, another thing I'll say about these patients is as if the owner really doesn't want to do a CT but wants an answer and you're suspecting that it could be a tumor, sometimes doing a sedated oral exam, you can look in that pterygopontine fossa area that area that's just caudal to the maxillary molar, and you might see some tumor there. I, I've diagnosed several tumors by a biopsy in that area. That's a lot more of an accessible area for, for you to biopsy than using that true cut biopsy, and you can potentially get an answer for them. Maybe it doesn't tell you where it is throughout the head, but, but unless the owner's gonna pursue advanced treatment, they might not need to know that information anyway. Maybe they just want to know that, yes, it is a cancer and it's, you know, severe enough that it's causing um, major abnormalities with the eye and the mouth, and that might be enough of an answer. So look in that area, caudal to the last maxillary molar, and if you see abnormal tissue there, um, biopsying that may, may give them the answer they need. So, um, we did check Buzz's pressures, and we also found that that left eye had a high pressure. Now, I know this can be a little bit confusing, but I don't, Buzz didn't really have glaucoma. He just had pressure that was pushed around his eye from all those, um, from all that tumor that was causing his pressure to go up. When we rechecked Buzz, he actually was visual in the eye, um, and so he, he could see out of that eye, indicating again that he did not have glaucoma. Um, his CEC chem was totally normal. Um, we did that CT with biopsy and it did come back as lymphoma. And we got lymphoma from both the um, biopsy we took of his mouth and also the biopsy we took from the orbit. So we discussed the treatment options with the owner. Obviously surgical treatment for a tumor like this is not gonna be possible, um, especially on its own. But we discussed potential referral for radiation therapy or um, potentially using indoor chemotherapy. The owners elected that, that they did not want to do that. 
Um, and so we ended up putting him on an oral steroid. I think it helped him a little bit, the oral steroid, but he didn't, it didn't help him a lot. So most of these patients that have orbital neoplasia, neoplasia if they're not pursuing some of these advanced treatment options, um, typically are gonna need to be put to sleep one to two months post-diagnosis. That's usually starts to cause enough problems with the eye, with the eye being exophthalmic and potentially being exposed and getting ulceration. It's a quality of life issue, or maybe they're having more trouble eating or just not feeling good. Um, and that usually leads to euthanasia, unfortunately. So for Buzz, we did a temporary tarsorophy. Um, he he um, was put on tobramycin because of the corneal ulcer and um, we put him on some pain medication. Um, after we got the biopsy result back, again, they did want to switch and try an oral steroid. So we put him on an oral steroid um, and left him on that, you know, um, long term after, after tapering it a bit. So orbital neoplasia is, um, is you know, not uncommon, but we can often see whatever the normal tissue is around the eye. So we tend to see fibrosarcomas. Um, you can obviously see lymphoma in that area, osteosarcomas, meningiomas, and, and even squamous cell carcinomas, particularly in cats, um, can, be, can be seen in the orbit. Um, so don't tend to be ulcerated on the surface, but um, we see that tumor within the orbit. So talking in generalities about exophthalmics, if you see a, a dog that has exophthalmus, your major two differentials are gonna be neoplasia versus an abscess or cellulitis. So neoplasia tends to be in older patients, usually not very painful. Um, normally they have a normal CBC, they tend to be normothermic and they have a slower onset. Um, you know, even that cat Buzz had some symptoms a month ago with the sneezing, even though the owner didn't really recognize that was part of the same problem. Um, abscess, and cellulitis tend to be younger patients. Um, they tend to be more painful. Um, sometimes it can be very difficult to open the mouth because that ramus of the mandible, when you open the mouth, it pushes on the retrobulbar space and can be, as anybody who's had an abscess before knows, it's be very, very painful. So they, they're often very painful and you often cannot open their mouths because of their pain. Um, they tend to have an inflammatory CBC, although we didn't see that um, Oh, we did see that on our uh, Mastiff, um, but he did not have a fever. So they can obviously have a fever. Um, an onset can be more acute in general. There are other orbital diseases we can see. Um, you can see there is a zygomatic salivary gland, which is in the orbit and it's below the eye. So you can see um, retention cysts and mucoceles, um, sometimes secondary to trauma or other diseases. That's not very common. If you aspirated that area, you may get, you know, like a mucousy saliva-like uh, fluid out, um, and it's generally under the eye. Uh, you can also see something like extraocular muscle myositis. So this is a patient that's classic in young golden retrievers, but we can see it in other breeds. An immune-mediated disorder where the extraocular muscles become quite inflamed um, and, and so swollen that both eyes become exophthalmic, like this patient here. Um, and they generally respond well to immunosuppression, so oral steroids and potentially other immunosuppressives. Um, we can also see just myositis. If there's enough myositis there, it can push on the, um, on the orbit and um, cause the IV exophthalmic. You can also see orbital hematomas. This is usually more obvious that there's been some sort of trauma, hit by car, um, dog fights, that sort of thing is more common. So take home messages from this lecture, what I want you guys to get out of it um, is that eyelid masses in dogs are usually benign. So if you have a small eyelid mass that can usually be dealt with pretty easily with a wedge resection or cryotherapy. If you have a big eyelid mass, I really recommend a referral for cryotherapy or advanced surgery. Um, if it's something that you have cryotherapy in your practice, that may be a, a, a good place to use it. But I really wouldn't recommend attempting wedge resections or more complicated surgeries on these eyelid um, masses because they are usually benign. Um, blepharitis can have many causes, so doing cytology, doing scrapes, and if it's and if we ruled out some of those infectious causes, sometimes treating it um, as an immune-mediated disorder can be uh, useful.
Um, Retrobulbar cellulitis um, can often be treated medically um, if they don't have an abscess um, with broad spectrum antibiotics and um, pain medication, and usually respond well to that treatment. Whereas retrobulbar tumors um, may be able to be diagnosed by sampling other areas. So if it's not within your practice to be able to do, you know, a CT and a true cut biopsy, which it isn't for everybody, then uh, doing looking in the mouth or looking for tum like swelling around the eye that you could potentially biopsy may yield an answer for, for you and for the owner. So that's all I have for you tonight about eyelid masses and um, orbital disease, but I will take any questions um, if you want to um, ask those, um, Mariah can read them for me. I also have my email on here, so if you have any questions, um, you can always email us at eyes at We always, you know, try to answer those as quickly as we can. So if you have any questions about this topic or any other topics, I'm happy to, to answer you there also. Yeah, no questions right, right now. So yes, you guys will be getting um, your CE um, certificates probably in the next week. And then also if you do want to re um, watch this uh, webinar, we are going to be posting it at ndvet.com on the website. And we'll post the slides as well, the PDF. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming and attending um, our first, you know, uh, Zoom of our vet series. I hope, hope it worked well. If you have any suggestions for us on how to make this better, uh, please do let us know. We're always um, looking for ways to improve, and obviously this is a new way um, that we're doing this, this lecture series. All right, good night, everyone. Thank you.